Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Tamar Friedman. I'm the Senior Director of Programs here at Jewish Funders Network. And I'm really happy and proud to, to welcome you today to our program on new laws, new opportunities, ensuring Israelis with disabilities can obtain and retain employment. So much to discuss today. We have so many wonderful speakers that will be introduced to you in a few moments. So I don't want to even take up any more time, but I want to invite um, one of the biggest advocates I know and a wonderful partner in putting together this program, Jennifer Mizrahi, who will introduce our panel and give us some framing for, framing for today. So Jennifer, thank you so much. Um, and we look forward to learning together today. I am so thrilled that the Jewish Funders Network is hosting this webinar today, and it's just a tremendous opportunity, and I'm going to invite them to put up the slides of the terrific speakers uh, that we have. This is going to be a very interactive conversation, so we have a lot of speakers, but they're each going to speak very briefly so that we can have a dialogue at the end. But before we start, I want to raise your attention that at the bottom of your screen, you can see a little CC. And if you click on the CC, that will give you instant captioning as we go along if you have um, a hearing issue or just want to have the live captions. Um, we are, again, as you heard, we're gonna speak about the new law and new opportunities for Israelis with disabilities to obtain and retain employment. We have a terrific group of speakers today. Ayala is the head of strategic partners um, for the JDC in Israel. The JDC plays a pivotal role both on workforce and on disability. These are two separate uh, parts of the JDC, but they really are terrific at bringing together public, private, philanthropic partnerships. So we're thrilled to have her on the panel. We will um, then hear um, from a terrific um, philanthropist, Orly, from the Azreli Foundation. Um, they are doing really cutting edge work on disability employment and other issues, not only in Israel, but also in North America. We'll hear from Ruben, who is the head of the Network of Jewish Human Service Agencies, which is this fabulous umbrella organization of over 150 Jewish nonprofits that are serving people, including those with disabilities who are seeking jobs. He's just helped complete a major, major analysis on what is working and what is not working in terms of disability employment and launched a major, very exciting new um, initiative. We're going to hear from Erin Riley from who is the founder of the Proven Program Project Search, which has the highest consistent employment outcome of any disability employment program in the world. And it already exists in many countries, not yet in Israel. And then we'll hear from Shalom Elcott, who's been working with us to try and build um, partnerships and coalitions and new thinking. Next slide, please. So as we talk about disability employment, I'd like to just lift up some faces of people with disabilities because philanthropy often thinks of disability in terms of what people cannot do instead of what they can do. So I put on the screen a series of faces of people with disabilities who are really world changers whether it was Stephen Hawking, who was unlocking the secrets of the universe from a wheelchair, or whether it's Itzhak Perlman, fabulous violinist, Greta Thunberg, uh, the leading climate activist, or in Israel, where you have Shirley Pinto and the energy minister, who are both people with disabilities, or Marley Matlin and Selma Blair, uh, Jews in Hollywood with disabilities, who have been really moving the needle in so many different way. People with disabilities have abilities. Uh, disability is, is something that you can't do that prevents a barrier to success, but it doesn't mean that you're not the absolute best person at something else. Next slide. There are many different kinds of disabilities, disabilities that are permanent, disabilities that are temporary. Um, people with who were born with a disability have a different set of challenges 
because they enter the school system uh, with that disability than people who acquire them later due to accident, aging, and, uh, and other issues. I'm gonna put in the chat that today, the New York Times has a page one story because in the United States, we now have the highest disability employment in history, the highest in history. And that took a lot of different pieces. And these are the same sorts of pieces that we can use in Israel. Number one, it's good laws. Number two, it's making sure that the government agencies function appropriately and collaborate together to implement those laws. It's the key role of self-advocates. I will mention that I myself am dyslexic and have ADHD. It's very important to have self-advocates at the table. It's the role of the inclusive employers um, of which there are so many. It's the new innovations in accessible tech, the free training you can get online, philanthropists such as those who are online with us today, and the rise of remote work um, and the labor shortages, which have combined to create sort of a perfect storm to make new outcomes better. Now, I want to point out that some places, some states have twice the disability employment rate as other states. So for example, where I live in Maryland, over 50% of people with disabilities in one county have jobs, whereas only a half as many uh, percentage-wise in a different county have jobs. So how you implement these things really, really impacts uh, people's lives and livelihoods. And in Israel, we have some fabulous opportunities. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ayala, who's gonna walk us through some of this potential, including some links to some important data. Take it away, Ayala. Thank you. Can't have a Zoom meeting without somebody muted. Um, so hi, everybody. My name is Ayala Davidowitz. I am the Director of External Relations at JDC Israel Unlimited, which is JDC's department dealing with people with disabilities. Um, I am in our office in Jerusalem at the moment. Um, I come into this world because I have a brother with disabilities, so this is very personal for me. And it's really exciting for me to see how many people um, are committed to this uh, to this topic and this issue. So I'm very excited to have everybody here today. Um, I'm going to start us off with some background on uh, people with disabilities in Israel, some statistics, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the new law that was passed recently um, to guarantee rights to people with disabilities. So you can see here, uh, slide number one, there are 1.5 million Israelis with disabilities, uh, which make up about 17% of the population. Um, uh, Jennifer alluded to it before, and, and we see that 80% of people with disabilities are not people that were born with a disability. So there's, there's um, also a lot of, uh, most people actually um, get their disability later in life, and many disabilities are invisible. So again, like Jennifer said, there's a lot of uh, learning disabilities, there's uh, um, psychiatric disabilities, and many more that are not visible. Um, to the naked eye. Um, next slide, please. Okay, we're going to be talking about employment today, so it was important for me to include something here about uh, working age Israelis. 16% um, of working age Israelis are living with a moderate to severe disability, which, as uh, you know, you can see by the way it sounds, is, means that they have that their lives are moderately or severely um, affected by the disability that they have, and what that means is that they their ability to work is also moderately to severely. Um, impacted. And when we look at people with disabilities, we see that they're much less likely to get uh, to achieve higher education. They're less likely to be employed. They're even less likely to find quality work. Um, the pay gap is significant. And so many, many people with disabilities and their family um, are struggling also with the issue of poverty. In addition to that, 47% of people with disabilities have more than one type of disability. Um, I'll just tell you what that means in, in Israel in our context, which is that um, the, the people with disabilities essentially fall under two different ministries. We have people with psych psychiatric disabilities who are under the auspices of the Ministry of Health. We have people with all other disabilities that are under the auspices 
of the Ministry of Social Services. And the ministries are not always great at talking to each other. They often try to pass people on from one ministry to the other. And that leads to a lot of um, uh, underutilization of rights, or it makes them very bureaucratic, very hard um, to actualize. Next slide, please. Okay, so public transportation is extremely important uh, when it comes to work or anything else, because I think as any of us know, it is the way that we do everything in life. It's the way that we get to school, it's the way that we get to work, it's the way that we build connections with our community, with our friends, with our family. And public transportation is, um, is an excellent infrastructure um, to allow people with disabilities to travel and to be part of the community. Um, and again, we see that out of the 17% um, that they make up the, of the population, only 1.5% of Israelis are using public transportation. Um, sorry, only 1.5% of Israelis are uh, people using public transportation or people with disabilities. So that's, um, that's a very low number and a number that we also really need to, to uh, improve in order to, to really make change um, also in the field of employment. Um, next slide, please. So until now, uh, we, were, we were focused mainly on the, the individual, but I also want to look at unemployment and underrepresentation in the workforce as um, on a systemic level. And we see that underrepresentation in the workforce in Israel costs the country 5 billion shekels a year. And that's not looking at um, what it costs to provide the services to people with disabilities. This is just underrepresentation in the workforce. So again, if we can raise those, the number, the uh, percentage of employment, if we can get more people with disabilities into the workforce, provide the services that they need in order to really integrate um, into the community, then that, that's, a, that's a vital part um, of, of uh, making this change. Um, so again, we're looking at a million and a half people that need that extra help to really integrate into society, and that's where the new law um, is extremely exciting and just an, an amazing um, new opportunity. If you could go to the next slide, please, that would be great. Um, so in June 2022, just a few months ago, um, the Israeli Knesset passed a new law for social services for people with disabilities. Um, now, I do not resent, represent the government, but um, as JDC, we work very, very closely with uh, the different, different ministries um, in our government, and I, you know, I can't, uh, um, I'll pat myself on the back a little, not myself, but my department uh, on the back a little bit, and I'll say that one of the things that JDC has been really pushing for a very long time now is um, many of the uh, the elements and the guiding principles that we also see in the UNCRPD, the Convention of Rights for People with Disabilities, um, and the right to autonomy and independent living in the community. And um, the head of the Disabilities Division at the Ministry of Social Services actually said that without working with JDC for the last 10 years, um, we wouldn't have been we wouldn't have been ready to, to address this new law. So that's something that's uh, very exciting for us. Um, and so when we, when we look at this new law, what it really does is protect the rights of people with disabilities that are under the auspices of the Ministry of Social Services. Until now, people that were under the Ministry of Health, so again, people with psychiatric disabilities, um, were protected by law. Their services were protected by law. Those under the Ministry of Social Services, so again, all other disabilities, um, were, were provided with services, but they weren't... Um, they weren't part of the law, which means that it depended on the state budget and meant that changes could happen, uh, you know, services could be uh, reduced or taken away. Um, now, that didn't happen on a regular basis. However, it made it, um, there was always kind of this question mark and things weren't really clear. And, and now that this new law has been put into place, it really protects those law, th those services to people with disabilities. And what it does is it focuses on independent living in the community, along with the support that they need in order to, uh, to um, uh, succeed in living independently in the community. And the idea here, and this connects to what you said, Jennifer, is 
is shifting the idea from the notion that people with disabilities are incapable of participating fully in society to the idea that they are capable, um, not only of leading their own lives, but of really being active participants in the community and society and the economy, et cetera. Um, and it also embraces this holistic view, it puts the person in the center and it recognizes their needs and their goals and, and takes a, into account their level of function and focuses on um, also on supportive assistance versus services that in the past maybe took away one's ability to make their own decisions. Um, so if we look at the, uh, break it down a little bit more, um, this new law gives, uh, it changes the way that we assess and evaluate and recognize people with disabilities. Um, it is, it provides a significant expansion of services, um, both in terms of developing new services um, for different levels of function and different goals and, and different needs, and also improving existing services. Um, again, it puts the focus on the person. So it provides this structure of personal budgeting where you decide um, what your needs are and you have more control over the services um, that you uh, utilize. And it also is going to reduce the number of institutions for people with disabilities and again, bring them out into the community and help them to live independently. Um, right now, the, the law is in this uh, sort of middle place where the, um, the sort of guiding principles of the law have been established and were passed in the Knesset. And now we're into the legislative part of the law, which is really all the intricate details of exactly who's going to be eligible for the services, what services it will include, how to adapt uh, current services to, new, to the new law, how, what new developments are, is, the, is the ministry going to focus on. And it has those, those four teams that are going to be working on those elements that I just mentioned to really to, uh, to, to help with the implementation of the law and the legislation needed to implement the law. Um, and those committees have been given now 18 months to complete uh, this part. So in, a, in the beginning of 2024, the law will actually um, come into effect. So I think that the, the most important thing to take away here is that the new law gives more independence, more autonomy, and more freedom uh, to people with disabilities to make their own choices and decisions. And again, by bringing people with disabilities more into the community um, and, and out of these and out of institutions, it's going to lead to um, less stigma. You're going to see more people with disabilities out and about into the community. And I think that will also help to create a, a more inclusive society here in Israel. So this is actually a very, very exciting um, new development here. Thank you so much, Ayala. That was fantastic. As people have questions, just put them in the chat and we will get to them at the end. Turning it over to Orly for a perspective from one of the leading philanthropists in this sector. Thank you so much. Good afternoon to everybody. And it is both a pleasure and an honor to be part of this panel. I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to express my joy and pride in Israel's passage of the social services law for people with disabilities. It's a very long name. It is a great step towards ensuring the right to employment for disabled individuals. As we celebrate Israel's incredible milestone in inclusive employment, I will also take a moment to share that Canada is also in the process of securing this right. There's no doubt that opportunities for the disability community are greater now than they were just a few years ago. For context, about 6.2 million people in Canada now live with a disability. That's 22% of the working age population and the largest single minority in the country. Yet, only 59% of disabled adults are employed, compared to 80% of those without a disability. And for the hundreds of thousands in Canada with ADHD, dyslexia, autism, intellectual disabilities, and other neurodivergent conditions, the rate of employment drops to a mere 22%. In Israel and Canada alike, the underrepresentation of neurodivergent individuals in the workforce does not reflect their actual talents, skills, and employability, exactly like Ayala was just sharing. The vast majority are willing and able to work, and with the right supports can make valuable social and economic contributions to society. The Israeli Foundation aims to open doors to opportunity for all. One of our priorities is to empower the often overlooked neurodivergent community. 
We are committed to supporting initiatives that improve the quality of life of neurodivergent people, enabling them to achieve their full potential, including meaningful employment. This commitment actually cuts across all of the work that we do at the foundation. The foundation's efforts on generating inclusive and meaningful employment for this underrepresented population is guided by the principle, nothing about us without us, and the concept of neurons to networks to neighborhoods. As these principles suggest, eliminating barriers to employment is a multifaceted process requiring the active and coordinated participation of all segments of society, those with and without disabilities. And it is a process in which the Ajayali Foundation is and will continue to be integrally involved. We have been surveying this space, listening to the needs of the population and discovering the gaps to exist to enhance our in-house in knowledge and make decisions on what and how we are supporting. Our current strategy for the neurodivergent employment sector is built on two pillars. The first is development, which is a significant portion of our financial and non-financial resources directed towards the strengthening and expanding the network of organizations, striving to remove barriers and provide opportunities. And the second pillar is to increase awareness about the benefits and importance of employing neurodivergent people. The benefits associated with this work are enormous, not only for the neurodivergent community, but for the neurodiverse community and really for everyone. Enhanced employment opportunities for neurodivergent individuals has the potential to ease recurring labor shortages, spur economic growth, increase prosperity for all, and help millions lead more joyful and fulfilling lives. To secure these benefits, we must overcome barriers to inclusive employment including, as Ayala mentioned, again, a lack of sufficient transportation, workplace accommodations, assistive technologies, work experience prior to leaving school, and sufficient long-term supports. Meaning, employers will have to work to improve how they recruit, retain, and further train neurodivergent employees. But perhaps the greatest barrier to employment for disabled individuals in general and neurodivergent individuals in particular, our low societal expectations and the reluctance of many to embrace true inclusiveness. The initial challenge for those with a disability is to acknowledge any discomfort they may have about working with and accommodating people who appear, act, or think differently. The second challenge is to overcome that discomfort and recognize and embrace everyone's abilities. Eliminating, the, eliminating these two barriers is beyond the scope of legislative mandates. The Ajayali Foundation recognizes that making Canada and Israel truly inclusive and consequently more prosperous is not only the obligation of government, NGOs, and a flourishing community of social enterprises. That obligation also falls squarely upon the shoulders of every single one of us. I will stop here for now and share on how this is implemented afterwards. Thank you, Orly. That was so fantastic. We're going to turn it over to Ruben because his organization has just done a major study as terms of what works and what doesn't work on disability employment and has now built a fabulous tool to help link together resources to help change the lives of people with disabilities and society around us. Thanks so much, Jennifer, and thank you all for being with me today. I think, um, Alana, you have the slides. That Awesome, thank you. Uh, so I, I just want to give a little bit of context about the network itself. The Network of Jewish Human Service Agencies is a membership association that was established in 2017 to support the Jewish human service sector primarily nonprofit organizations established to address human service needs in the Jewish community and beyond. Today, we have over 160 member agencies throughout the US, in Canada, and in Israel. And when I think about our primary focus, it's really focused on capacity building. Our role is to work to elevate the overall sector and to bring resources funding, training, learnings, connections, all to 
um, achieve greater impact in local communities and throughout these three countries. Uh, we, as Jennifer mentioned, through our best practice focus, we were fortunate to receive funding from the Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Foundation to undergo a study um, really focused on unpacking uh, best practice models in disability employment. And the impetus for the study came out of another JFN umbrella table that JFN convenes, which is the National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty. Um, that affinity group um, has a jobs work group. And at the jobs work group back maybe two or three years ago, there was discussion about really what were the segments of the communities that were most at risk for poverty, living either at or below the poverty level. Those were adults with disabilities. And all the statistics that you just heard from Israel and Canada um, in terms of uh, individuals with disabilities not being well represented in employment, um, they're really mirrored in the US as well. And so the foundation wanted to lift up and identify best practice program models. So the, there's a link in this and we'll get you um, also a link to the actual report, but we could go to the next slide. Um, what we we wanted to recognize that when you think about best practice and we spend time really thinking through a definition of how we at the network define best practice often what we learned was that these program models don't have the opportunity to um, be tested over a number of years as being evidence-based and so these aren't necessarily evidence-based. They're not subject to the rigor of universities, but we do believe they are best practice. They meet a demand, a demand in the community. They are truly responsive. They um, uh, gather the input and the guidance and the feedback of persons with lived experiences to inform the program design. They truly produce impact. We think that they could be replicated in other communities. And there's a lot of concern because our study lifted up over 30 innovative, creative, well-structured and truly impactful program models. But often most of them are only living in one or two regions of the country. Um, maybe they're not in Israel or they are in Israel and they're not in the US or on the West Coast, but they're not on the East Coast. And so, uh, you know, it's great to have this forum today to be able to share um, these models because we do believe that they absolutely could be replicated. And they are, we think, sustainable. These are models that either have a, a solid funding plan, a solid track record in being able to um, be real, realistic and achievable with the, on the expense side of implementing the program. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, within Israel, our study lifted up, um, as I said, over 30 programs. There were two in particular. Uh, we looked both within the member agencies of the network and we looked beyond. And in Israel, we were able to lift up and identify a program being implemented by Israel Elwin. Uh, which is a large NGO in Israel that serves individuals with disabilities at all age levels, children, adults, and older adults. And during COVID in particular, they launched an initiative that they called the Open Door Employer Campaign, which was an aggressive social media and outreach effort um, to really educate employers that persons with individuals could be valuable appropriate and meaningful additions to their workforce. And I'm just going to, um, pre-COVID and even during COVID, these, this model was serving over 1,200 people, both individualized and cohort-based, placing clients in um, community-based, competitive, integrated employment settings. And just noting a couple of uh, different employers, including Aroma, the Dunn Hotel chain and, and the Knesset itself. Um, I, we also lifted up the um, special and uniform program of the Jewish National Fund, 
which serves over 450 individuals with disabilities, also through individualized and cohort-based structures, um, supporting employment of that population within the IDF, within the Israeli Defense Force. And I just want to note, um, Project Search, which you'll hear about in a moment, was also described in our study, but is not yet operating in Canada or the or um, or in Israel. We'll go to the next slide. Um, I think this is just interesting because it talks about who these programs overall are serving. By and large, these programs are serving individuals with IDD, intellectual or developmental disability, and um, at the low end, very very few. Um, with uh, blind or visually impaired or with hearing impairment. Um, uh, you know, I think it's interesting. Our agencies, both within the network and beyond, are really focused on IDD, autism, mental health and cognitive learning disability. Uh, but as it gets to physical mobility or other issues, there are less program models out there. So it's just something worth noting. Um, let's go to the Next slide. And with this, Jennifer referenced this previously. I just want to give a shout out to a model that we were able to launch this year in the US with philanthropic support, primarily again coming from the Harry and Jeanette Weiberg Foundation, initially developed as a COVID response to address widespread unemployment in a variety of different industries and different regions throughout the US. We have been successful in developing what we call a continuum of service being implemented in the U.S. by 19 agencies who are um, together each putting a range of their service offerings in the employment service arena, in the workforce development arena, on a continuum to make those services available via virtual platforms. If you think about the power of Zoom, we've learned during COVID that we could provide service delivery through Zoom um, and we could do it very effectively. And we also learned that people could be hired via Zoom and people could interview and look for jobs via Zoom. And so the network agencies have worked together to really lift up this model. Um, and we're doing so with a couple of different um, service buckets, all of which include focused efforts to support individuals with disabilities, um, with employment who struggle often with access. And if you could do it via Zoom virtually, it really doesn't matter where you live um, in the country or where you're you know, located in terms of being able to get to a physical agency office, um, if you could access Wi-Fi and get onto a computer, um, we can help you. And it, uh, we are providing both individual career assessments and personal coaching. Um, and over 1,300 individuals were served in the first six months of the program. And we're also providing workshops and a series of multi-session training opportunities, an average of about 60 to 80 different opportunities per month. And over 2,600 individuals were served in, this, in the first six months. Um, and just under 400 job placements uh, were made. Um, with both national, regional, or local employers. Um, and just, we have U.S. figures here at the bottom with the average median, with the median, I'm sorry, annual salary um, in the range of 53,000 or the hourly range for hourly uh, positions in the range of 18. Uh, this is a model that we have just begun some preliminary dialogue and research with our Canadian partners to see about bringing it to Canada. And we do think that there are elements of this that could work in Israel as well. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Jennifer. Thank you so much, Ruben. That was fantastic. For philanthropists, it's so incredibly important to have some data on what works and what um, and how much it costs to deliver the success. And, and your report really is transformative as is this network that you have built. As uh, we mentioned, Project Search is a proven program 
that Aaron started and Aaron's about to speak about it, but I am incredibly, incredibly thrilled that Orly and the team from Azraeli have played an incredibly major role that is not yet very much publicly known, that it is about to be in Canada in a big and very important way. And this is a terrific um, public-private partnership with um, many service provider experts involved in this partnership with Project Search. And it is one of the models that I think has huge potential in Israel, uh, particularly given this new law. So turning it over to Aaron to describe this program, which is so different than so many others. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm delighted to be here today. And and thank you, uh, Ruben, for setting the stage for my comments and all the other speakers. Uh, you know, uh, we have visited Israel and uh, and worked closely with organizations there, and we've done a lot of work in in Canada. And as Jennifer uh, mentioned, um, you know, currently we have about eleven programs throughout Canada. We have actually have programs in uh, three provinces, uh, and uh, we're working with the Ministry of Education in uh, Ontario, and we are beginning, uh, we're working with uh, an Ontario uh, and a group there uh, who's working very closely with the Azraeli Foundation. We're very excited to begin that work. But Project Search, we started uh, about 20 years ago. We started at Children's Hospital Medical Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. We recognized that uh, changing the outcome for a, a young person with a disability is not just about a hospitalization. You you know, transition to adulthood is perhaps the most in, important step in that if we were going to care and uh, about independence and if we were going to care about autonomy and we were going to care about uh, living independently, we had to care about employment because it really was the cornerstone that put set all of those things in a place and allowed them to happen most successfully. And so we started a training program um, that allowed us to train people and give them the preparation they needed for employment. To talk about employment and to hope it happens is is kind of uh, useless if people with disabilities don't have the skills and the adult behaviors to actually gain employment beyond that, which is stereotypical. Um, and that allows them to be out in the community doing the jobs that they are so incredibly capable of and, and jobs that are meaningful, interesting to them and that are beyond those that maybe they've just been doing for years and years because that's all that they were ever allowed to do. And so we wanted to break down the doors and, and do something really different. So we started a model that, in fact, as Ruben said, was evidence-based. And we do have a model that uses a portal. We collect data. We uh, have our own scientists. We uh, are subjected to rigorous study. We have 707 programs currently, um, and uh, all of our programs are required to input data. We all use, we follow model fidelity. We, uh, and, and basically, we always partner with a business, schools, government, service providers, people with disabilities, most importantly, and I think second, their families. And so, our team always has, uh, as our teams have a similar makeup. Uh, it takes a while to get them set up. It's not an overnight process. Um, each one of our programs takes about six to eight months to put in place. And it's really a robust process. We use resources and toolkits. Uh, we assist them in creating best practices. It involves a lot of training. Um, you know, what we do we can move it to other countries. We, we provide a template. We are portable and transferable. However, we adjust to culture. We adjust to, to the local knowledge base, the local setting. Uh, 
you know, I would say we adjust to set and setting uh, is what we say. And most importantly, we are run by the partners on the ground. Um, and, you know, we, we go into a set and a setting. We teach uh, a group of partners how to run our program. We give them the tools to do it, and then we leave. And they have expertise and expectations that they must follow from there on out. And, um, and we continue to work with them in providing education and maintaining contact, but we do not run the program. And so, for example, just this morning, I heard from my, the head of uh, March of Dimes uh, in Canada. And March of Dimes is actually the largest service provider uh, for people with disabilities in all of Canada. They have decided that they're going to hire a person, uh, a Canadian-wide uh, position, to uh, put in charge of the existing programs project search programs they have uh, to run them, make sure that they follow model fidelity, but also to create new project search programs because they've seen what it can do and they want to expand it across Canada. And so they will have one person in Canada who is responsible for all new project search programs. And we love that because then it gives us one point person for March of Dimes that we can work with. In general, Project Search is a school to work transition. It's a year, nine month program that goes into a business uh, and we train people in skills so that at the end of that nine months, they can go out and get a job in an area that's of interest to them and in which they've been taught those skills and take those skills back into the community and get a fabulous job. Um, and then we follow them for the rest of their lives. We're not looking for a, a you know, three-month job or a six-month job. We're looking for a career. And uh, we will help them keep their job for the rest of their lives. And we will also help them grow in that career and seek promotions. Um, and so that's what we do. Uh, my thanks to this entire group and my thanks to Jennifer for inviting me today. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Erin. That's terrific. We're going to jump back to Orly, um, who's been such a key uh, leader in this. Great. Thank you so much. And really, I think even what I'm about to share reemphasizes everything that we have heard up until now. Um, so as I did mention in my earlier remarks, Azalea Foundation does take a multifaceted and holistic approach to creating employment opportunities for neuro neurodivergent individuals. Um, it really is through the extensive mapping, the data and ongoing learnings that we just got to hear and experience ourselves that we are able to really understand and take the opportunity to actively assess the needs of the sector and identify how and where we are going to actually invest and help move the needle and create that change. So, um, as mentioned, we do recognize that there is a need to create more programs for vocational training and for promoting self-employment. We must ensure that neurodivergent individuals, though, also receive fair wages without losing eligibility for the needed public assistance. The two examples I am going to talk about is Project Search, just because we have heard so much amazing information that we've learned about it right now. And the second one is Kishorit, which exists in Israel and is located in Israel and it was not mentioned in Ruben's presentation. So both these programs were developed with significant input and participation from neurodivergent individuals, potential employers, and people with the knowledge and skills to implement the project effectively, efficiently, and sustainably. While they both exist within larger frameworks and support system, they focus on different parts of the employment journey. Both projects empower independence and meaningful employment, though each uses a different, but equally important methodology. As you heard, Project Search uses a highly successful model, and it was introduced to Ontario as an innovative best practice in 2019. In Ontario specifically, the project was launched as a partnership which you've heard, 
between a Holland and Bloorview, the Toronto's United Health Network, Toronto District School Board, and the Community Living Ontario. It is part of a basket of services that Holland and Bloorview provides for their employment pathways and is being partially funded by the Ontario government. Holland Bloorview and its affiliated, affiliated research institute are internationally recognized for their dedication and leadership in improving the lives of children with disabilities and their family, families through client and family-centered research and services. Belgi Ali Foundation is funding the components of the expansion of their employment services, including the project search, that aren't covered by the government and encourages additional private public funded programs. And I actually just want the fact that March of Dimes is taking on a larger role. So it's really exciting and really happy to hear. Keisha Reed, on the other hand, is home for life in the Western Galilee for adults with developmental disabilities. It is home to 170 people over the age of 18. And at any given time, there's up to 20 volunteers spending a year at Keisha Reed before enlisting in the Army. Kishorit is a well-established organization with a well-developed referral network. Kishorit's inclusive model offers an outstanding opportunity to expose the neurotypical community to people with diverse needs and abilities, all who play an important and responsible part of their community. The adults who live in Kishorit are not called patients or clients, but members. Each member has the right to decide how to conduct his or her life while receiving residential, social, and vocational services, as well as support for special physical and cognitive needs. Their primary goal is to enable members to live full, independent lives with opportunities for integration into the broader community. The majority of their annual budget is funded by the Israeli government. The Israeli Foundation is funding the pilot of 10 new vocational training programs with the hope that the government will find it once deemed successful. The Israeli Foundation's mission is to open doors, create catalytic change, and address grand challenges. Our primary focus moving forward is to support more programs like Project Search and Kishorit, and many of those that are mentioned today, while adhering to the principles of nothing about us without us. I'm handing it back now to Jennifer, or Shalom, I think. Thank you so much. Um, Shalom. I'm here. Excellent. You want to give us a little, uh, we're going to take questions in just a moment. So if people want to start putting questions in the chat, please go ahead and do so. Um, and also, I'm not sure if we can put you on camera with the questions. Um, um, JFN can let us know. But Shalom, tell us a little bit about what are the next steps that we might want to think about? Thank you, and, and, and thanks to everybody. It was great to hear all of this together. Look, we have an opportunity in time. We have this major law in Israel that's a game changer. We have uh, both previous, current, and, and possibly next Israeli governments that are really behind this. And we have the ministers and the people who work in those ministries working to make this come together. So we have a moment in time as funders to come together to work with all of the players in the ground from the government to providers, to the municipalities, to the NGOs that, that Orly mentioned and others to come together in a really impactful way to make this happen. And under JFN's umbrella, I believe we have a possibility to make that happen in the short term. So that's really, I think where we're going Jennifer and anyone that's willing to, you know, roll up their sleeves. If you really want to be involved in a project where you see the metrics happening, where you're involved in that process, I believe that's what this has become. So thank you to everybody, Aaron, and your work. And and by the way, Project Search, they know Israel. They're launching effectively in Canada. And it could also be a great model to uh, to put on the ground in Israel. So thanks, Aaron, for your work. Thanks, and, and maybe if I can invite everyone to put their cameras on so that we can have a conversation. I think all the presentations were really um, fabulous. I don't see any uh, questions yet um, in the chat. Um, did anyone 
who's uh, listening want to jump in with a question at this point. So I'm going to start with a question. Um, my question is, to make this work in Israel, let me ask Ayala, who are the major players in something like this in terms of the ministries or the industries or some of the um, amutot? Who are some of the major players that we'll want to have on board? And then if anyone else wants to jump in in terms of who might be part of a coalition. Um, I think it's a it's a fabulous question. I think that um, there isn't just one answer. I think there are so many excellent um, nonprofit organizations and we thought here in Israel um, that deal um, with, a, you know, anything from employment to services and skills to, in order to to achieve gainful employment. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to like name any by name because we we work with so many and there's so many that we don't work with that we that um, are also excellent. Um, I think that some of the big names were were named here. Um, and in terms of uh, the government, I think that it's something that's that's probably going to be looked at, um, particularly when it comes to uh, the new law and providing services for people based on their goals and what they want to achieve in their lives and the support that they need in order to really um, feel empowered and, and to participate in society. And so I think that um, that will definitely, I think the Ministry of Social Services will probably be involved. I think the ministry, um, that they also deal with the issue of labor. I think that, um, and, and I think that, there's gonna there's gonna be just a lot of people uh, around the table I think and and one of the things that I really also want to put out there is the importance of having people with disabilities around the table the importance of having families of people with disabilities around the table um, and and acad ac uh, academia um, I think these are all very very important voices and and there are roundtables that bring these people together. Um, at the JDC, that's one of the things that we really focus on is bringing the, the right um, partners around the table, whether it's, again, NGOs, operating partners that we work with or don't work with yet, um, people with disabilities and their families, because really more than any, more than anybody else, people with disabilities and their families know um, what, the, what the real needs are. Great. I just want to point out that the chat is disabled and you use the Q&A at the bottom to ask a question. So just put the Q&A in. And so I, I want to point out that the Jewish Funders Network um, used to have a disability task force. And that task force um, had a summit in New York City where we looked at disability employment. And one of the things was that the Butler Family Foundation um, initially funded Project Search in New York. And that um, the way it worked was then they brought together the school system of New York, which paid for special educators and the vocational rehabilitation organizations of New York. And so now philanthropy doesn't have to pay for the program anymore because the blending and braiding of the funding from the government sources came together. And that's one of the things we'd like to see in Israel, because as we heard, there's a question from Jordana, can you explain again better what the innovation of the law is? One of the big problems with the current law is that people with disabilities other than mental health disabilities really didn't have the protection that would enable the government uh, to take over some of the funding. But I wondered if maybe, um, maybe we could hear from JDC or from from, from others, um, other things that you think the opportunity of the law is. And then um, somebody has written, what can we do to support these initiatives? Is there an umbrella organization that is um, raising funds for this? And I will say that there is not yet. Um, this, this is part of the conversation that we don't have an umbrella yet. I will say that the JDC plays a very important umbrella role on disability and on workforce, both, but the workforce initiative typically doesn't work on disability employment and the, dis and the disability section doesn't have a particular outcome in terms of employment. So even blending and braiding within that organization is an opportunity. And I will also say that network 
JHSA is a terrific um, potential, um, you know, collaborator and partner for this because this is what they're doing with their M enabled program, which doesn't yet exist in uh, in Israel by pulling people together that we do have some opportunities, but it's something I think for funders to discuss and collaborate around, but I wonder if um, um, you know, if, if, if some of the speakers can comment on that, and I'm just going to give another um, a question from an anonymous attendee. In one presentation, Special in Uniform was mentioned, a great and important program, but a number of organizations have similar programs with the IDF. As a funder, I get approached by numerous disability organizations that all purport to do the same thing. Couldn't some umbrella organization help us differentiate what are the differences between the organization and who really does utilize the best practice, for which I will say you actually have to read Ruben's report. <laughs> that is really important to read because that really helps on that. But I will also say that there are some great programs like LOTEM, like Kisarit, like Akim, mm -hmm. um, the work of Bishut and others in Israel that are fabulous that were not in the report um, for a variety of, of reasons. But let me actually see Orly if you want to jump in on some of these uh, some of these issues. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, and I'll just add that actually we support Ro'im Rechok, which also does something very similar where it focuses on um, integrating people with disabilities and very various disabilities um, into the IDF as well at different points. Um, and at the end of the day, I would say there's room for everybody and there's a lot of need. And I think it's about finding what is the right approach for you and what do you connect with? Um, and it's also, we as a funder are always talking to other philanthropic entities to really also help discuss those opportunities and look at how we could approach a topic or challenge um, all together as well, uh, and also provide some of that guidance to one another. But I would say, as long as they're doing good work, and it fits in line with what you want to be supporting, um, and it's a best practice, I would say it's, it is worth considering. And just because they're not on the list here, it doesn't mean that they're important. Um, for the foundation, it's really all about right sizing. So it's also smaller organizations that are addressing a very specific gap or specific need that isn't really being touched by anybody else or supported by anybody else. So some of the bigger ones like JVC are doing unbelievable work that we are supporting as well, but there's lots of other ones who may be less known, but are as important. Who else would like to jump in on any of those? Ayala? I'm happy to, to talk about um, the, the new law and also what you mentioned, Jennifer, about um, the field of employment. Um, I'll just say that in JDC, it is employment is something that we worked with in the past in terms of people with disabilities. Um, one of the reasons that we decided um, to take a step back from that was because we really wanted to focus on the areas where we felt we could have the most impact. And one of the things that we looked at was whether there are other players in the field that could really make a difference. And we saw that there were many, many, many that really focus on employment for people with disabilities. And therefore we decided to take a step back, let them take the lead and take on um, a role in areas where there wasn't really a presence. So um, that's number one. And in terms of Tibet, um, unfortunately the, the government was also looking at um, different areas that are more pressing to them. I don't remember the statistics because I don't uh, work in, specifically in this field, but um, in the, you know, when it comes to, um, um, in, in about, I think it's like by 2040 or 2050, the number of the uh, Arabs and the Haredi population are going to be about 50% of the population. And therefore, the main focus of our department on working on employment is looking at those um, populations that are underrepresented um, when it comes to uh, quality employment. So I'll just put that aside for now. Um, and when it comes to the, um, I see it in the questions that was uh, you asked about um, the innovations of the law. So again, um, until now, people that weren't that were 
uh, that did not have a psychiatric disability, all other disabilities were not protected by law, um, were not, um, the services that they were getting were not guaranteed. And so number one, in terms of protecting rights and services to people with disabilities, this law is completely innovative and is very, very, very important. Um, and in terms of the sort of uh, content innovation of the law, um, there, are, there are new ways of looking at people with disabilities. So again, um, where um, there is a place for diagnosis, obviously, and, and putting a name to somebody's disability, the, the focus really is on their function, their ability to function, what their needs are. Not everybody with Down syndrome has the same, uh, the same needs. Not everybody with autism has the same needs. Not everybody with ADHD has the same needs. And so really looking at the needs of the particular person, how really having a person-centered focus, um, both in terms of assessment and evaluation and, and defining uh, disabilities, and also in terms of the services that the government provides. Mm -hmm. So whereas once upon a time it would have been, okay, the government is willing to give you A or B, now the government is saying, no, what do, what do you need? And you know, it could be that for the person will say, actually, I need F and G, and, and the, those are the things that are really gonna help me achieve my goals. And the government's gonna say, um, you know, all right, let's 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 do that. Um, and so, and the, the last thing that I'll say is that there is very much a focus on moving people out of institutions and into independent living in the community, which is um, when we're talking about inclusion and when we're talking about equal opportunities, when we're talking about anything related to bringing people with disabilities out into the community and really making them part of uh, the social, you know, the social aspect of society, the economic aspect of society, the civic aspect of society, um, that's, that really, really plays a key role. So I just want to jump in and first of all, thank you and say that uh, when the government and when uh, workforce agencies in Israel are looking at the marginalized populations they're trying to serve, um, obviously a subset of the Orthodox community or the um, Arab community are people with disabilities. The same is true in any population because disability spans every demographic. But one of the problems in workforce programs globally has been that they're not accessible. They don't have captions on their videos. They don't have websites that are screen reader accessible. They're in buildings that if you use a wheelchair, you can't get in. And if you can get in, you can't use the bathroom, that they don't know how to use any of the assisted technology that now exists. So these are some of the barriers that we have to address that even if the government doesn't say we're going to go after a disability population per se as a specific population immediately, that if there are people with disabilities within the populations they're already serving, which is predominantly the Haredi population and the Arab population in Israel, that those amongst that population who have disabilities need to be served just like anybody else. I think Tamar is looking to me like a wee Yeah, sometimes. no, no, I feel so bad to have to cut this off. We knew from the beginning that this was going to be with so many, so many wonderful speakers and so much information to share that this was going to, to be hard to cram into just an hour. But thank you all. Thank you, Jennifer, Shalom, Orly, Ayala, and Aaron, and Ruben, who had to leave just a, a moment ago. Thank you for sharing this. Thank you for all of you that have joined us today. And I think this shows that this is just not the beginning of a conversation, because I know that so many of you here have had these conversations for so many years and are pushing this so much about continuing the conversation. And I hope that this will just be one of these next steps to continue. Um, and we will in the next few days send out the recording and the links to many of the things that were mentioned today once the recording is edited so that we can, we can be in touch and continue and see how we can be, um, take this new law and this new opportunity and move it forward. So thank you all and have a wonderful day.